Good evening and welcome to our fifth installment in our series User Manual for Humans. So tonight we'll have uh, another good talk. We're going to get uh, get some good material covered. And um, a lot of times people don't really understand what, what health is about or why it matters or they, they feel fine, they're still young, they still don't have any major diseases. But we're going to talk about blood sugar and diabetes. And this is one of the most important, one of the most prevalent conditions we've ever seen. And it's epidemic, it's exploding. Um, we'll, talk, we'll give you some statistics toward the end to, to scare you some. And if, if you're taking good care of yourself, then I'm sure that you know someone who doesn't who needs to know this information. So take good notes and pass this on. We will talk about the purpose of blood sugar. What is it for? What does it do in the body? What sort of balance do we need to maintain? Uh, the process of absorption, because that's crucial in determining the level of blood sugar. Uh, what are the hormonal effects? And that's primarily insulin we'll talk about. Uh, what is insulin resistance? Because most people know that that's a bad thing and that it could lead to diabetes, but how does it all work? And then we'll talk about diabetes, which today affects 8.3% of the U.S. population that are full-fledged diabetics. And there's many times that number of people that are pre-diabetic. One of my favorite quotes, what gets us in trouble is not what we don't know, it's what we know for sure that just ain't so. That's Mark Twain. And there are so many things that we're going to cover in these series that are well-established facts that they, the establishment, the people who know say this is the way it is, and yet we find out a few years later or the people on the cutting edge know that it just ain't so. Uh, for one thing, since we're talking about diabetes, the food pyramid says that we should eat 8 to 11 servings of grains every day. Well, that's an excellent recipe to get diabetes. If you're not in the risk zone, just follow the food pyramid and before you know it, you'll be there. Uh, let's talk a little bit about why we, why we end up in this position. First of all, why do sweets taste so good? I think that's the biggest problem for a lot of people. And we have to think back and look at survival advantage. And back many thousands of years ago, there wasn't a whole lot of sweets. So the taste of sweet helped humans to select the foods that gave quick energy. So back then, it was basically uh, fruits and an occasional hum, uh, beehive that you ran across. Those were the sweets that we had. Uh, and the more that you could quickly get energy into the body, the, the better your chances of survival. And if there was abundant food, then wherever you could find sweet and rich food, you could pack on some fat, and that would help you survive later in times of starvation. So that's why we have that mechanism in the first place. And it never became a problem until we started processing food and extracting the, the source of the sweet flavor, the sugar, uh, out of the natural food and processing it so it became widely abundant and we can have it as syrup and Coca-Cola and candy. And now it's a completely different animal. Uh, they've estimated that back in the day when they were hunter-gatherers, that if they ran across an occasional beehive, that was the only refined sugar that they would ever come across. And just kind of guesstimating, they assumed that if you find four pounds of honey per year, per person, that's pretty, that you're still pretty lucky. But that would, add, that would amount to about one teaspoon per day. So essentially, for the period of time that your DNA has developed, you've been exposed to about one teaspoon a day. So that's the amount of sugar that, that you're fine with. Anything else is a little bit of a burden on the body. Uh, back in the day, there was no such thing as bread, pastries, waffles, pasta, syrup, pancakes, candy, cookies, chocolate, pasta, and so on and so on and so on. These items did not exist. They, they just 
weren't in, in existence. So because of that, your DNA has never encountered those foods. Uh, your body can deal very well with short-term starvation, but it has no defense against chronic abundance of processed foods. Historical adaptation, again, we've mentioned this a little bit before, but the DNA of Homo sapiens has not changed significantly in about 40,000 years. We've been hunter-gatherers, we've come across the occasional beehive, we've eaten fruits and vegetables, we've hunted meat and game, and that's what our DNA recognizes, that, what, that's what we know what to do with. Then, in the last 4,000 years, which is a blink of time in, in, in evolution, in, in terms of changing DNA, we've introduced agriculture. So we had more than an occasional few grains, but there was still no processing at all. Then, in the last few hundred years, we have had a modest availability of processed sugar and processed grains. And 150 years, in terms of, compared to 40,000, again, it's, it's a blink. There's, it's, there's no time for the body to adapt. And in the last 50 years, we've had an abundance of sugar. Uh, in this country, I think the, it's roughly a half a pound of sugar per person per day. Okay? And I don't eat my half a pound, so someone's <laughs> eating mine as well. That's, that's astounding. That's 800 calories of sugar, refined sugar and syrup and corn syrup per day. So that is why, and, and then of course we add the starch and the white bread and the waffles to that, there's no wonder that there's an epidemic of diabetes. So let's talk a little bit about the process. What is blood sugar and what's the process of getting? So first, we eat the food and it's in our gut. Then it has to be digested and just because we put something into the mouth doesn't mean that it is functional and available to the body. It has to pass across a number of membranes through a post process of digestion and absorption and then it gets into the bloodstream and now it exists in the form of sugar as glucose molecules in the bloodstream and it is still of absolutely no use to the body because the only place we can use the sugar is inside of cells so now we have to get it from the bloodstream and into the cell and this doesn't happen by itself there are there are gates and there are receptors on the cells to absorb, to take in the sugar, but these gates, they don't work without insulin. So that is what insulin is all about. That is the function of insulin is that it activates the receptors so that we can get the sugar into the cell. You have a little receptor, the insulin attaches to it, and now that gate is open for the sugar. And this is important to realize, and the more processed the food is, the quicker it will get into the bloodstream and the faster your blood sugar will rise. We'll talk more about this. So weight gain is not about how many calories you eat. It is in a way, but not really, and here's why. When the sugar gets into the bloodstream, when, when the food gets into the bloodstream faster than we can use it and get it into the cells and burn it off, then the excess has to be stored. Okay, And we can only store about 800 calories worth, 200 grams or so worth of sugar and carbohydrates, and the rest of it has to be turned into fat. So fat develops when the food we eat gets into the bloodstream too fast, we have to get a lot of insulin to get it into the cell and whatever the cell can't use at the time gets converted to fat. So the, it's not so much the 
the, the amount of food we eat, but how is it processed by the body. And interestingly, fat and protein gets into the bloodstream very, very slowly. So fat and protein do not contribute to weight gain unless you just completely, totally stuff yourself every day. Um, so now we will talk about blood sugar and how it works. So you have a diagram here on slide 8 and we want to see if we can illustrate this. Here is the amount of blood sugar and here is a very narrow band and this is right around 100 milligrams of blood sugar per liter. Now, what happens in the body if your blood sugar goes significantly below or significantly above, we can get in what's called a diabetic coma. You literally, physically get into a coma. Your brain stops working if you get very far outside of this zone, either above or below. So that means this is where the body wants to be and when anything gets far away from it, it's an emergency. It's life-threatening for the body. So this is very, very high priority for the brain. Uh, glucose, blood sugar, is the primary fuel for the brain it can really only use, it can use a little bit of ketone bodies and so forth, but glucose is really the only fuel that the brain uses. So it's very important for the brain to function for us to have a normal level. And again, the brain stops functioning if we get above or below. So if we eat let's say that we are starting around the lower end of this hundred and we get hungry and we eat a meal, a hunter-gatherer meal. We, we catch ourselves a rabbit and we find some roots and some leafy greens and, and we make ourselves a, a meal. That meal is going to be digested because it's protein, because it's whole food, lots of fiber, good stuff. It will be absorbed very slowly into the bloodstream. So over the next few hours, the blood the blood sugar rises very, very slowly and we'll say this is one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. Now remember we have to use insulin to get the blood, the sugar, out of the blood and into the cell. Because this is of no use to the body until we can get it into the cell. So now we secrete insulin. The pancreas, which sits right around here, releases insulin and the insulin takes the sugar out of the blood. So once we have a certain amount of insulin, the blood sugar will start falling again and it will go back down. And then the body has some reserves so the body can maintain it within this level for quite some time. So this is what the body wants. This is what whole foods and real food and food with fiber and protein and fat does. But that's not what we eat anymore. How much sugar do we have in the bloodstream at any given time? A hundred milligrams of blood sugar per deciliter multiplied by the volume of blood that you have in your body means that you have in your bloodstream at any given time five grams of sugar. That's it. One teaspoon of sugar is all you want in your bloodstream at a time. That's all your brain can handle. So going from the lower end of this to the upper end of this is about a span of 20 milligrams of sugar. That's one gram that is how much your blood sugar can fluctuate before it becomes a reason for your body to respond and change it before it becomes an emergency, if you will. 
it's not getting a little bit outside it's not really an emergency but the body will respond it'll try to keep it within this level which is about one gram difference so that's a fifth of a teaspoon uh, how much sugar is in a coke 40 okay so if your body can only fluctuate if your blood sugar can fluctuate one gram and you dump in 40 grams of something that will be absorbed in 15 minutes do you think that's a bit of a stress to the body because it's never in in the history of mankind has it been exposed to 40 grams of liquid sugar that just goes rushing straight into the bloodstream so this is what happens with real food now I'll just draw on top of this now let's say that you have a cup of coffee with a little sugar in it and you have donuts and uh, coca-cola or, or, or apple juice for breakfast so now your blood sugar let's say that this is a hundred two hundred three hundred four hundred your blood sugar can very very quickly get up to about three four hundred and it will do it even faster than this it will it'll happen in 15 20 minutes Remember we said this is an emergency? What has, ha what has to happen? What is the body going to do about this emergency? It's going to release a lot of insulin, exactly. And because this is an emergency, it's not going to hold back. It's going to dump all the insulin it can, basically, to try to get this craziness under control. So with this much insulin in the bloodstream assisting the sugar getting into the cells how quickly is the blood sugar going to drop almost instantaneously it's going to drop as fast as it came up so the blood sugar comes crashing down and then it gets to the normal level of hundred do you think with this much insulin and going down at this rate, do you think it's going to stop smoothly right around 100 and flatten out? It's going to keep going. It's going to keep going. And then eventually it'll taper off because now we have an emergency on the other side. So what is this called? What's the name for this, this place? When your blood sugar is really low hypoglycemia hypoglycemia exactly what does it feel like when you have hypoglycemia very sluggish sluggish irritable <laughs> cranky and what do you get cravings mm -hmm. why do you get cravings because this is very unhealthy the brain doesn't work so the brain says give me some fuel quickly and what's the fastest source more coca-cola <laughs> mm -hmm. more sugar more starch more juice give me something quick so that I can come back to life so then you have some other snack or a muffin or something and up it goes and then it shoots back down and up and down this people who have hypoglycemia they really cannot develop hypoglycemia without this mechanism this is the cause of hypoglycemia it's the roller coaster the craziness of all these swings in blood sugar okay so one more little footnote what happens to all of these calories that you ingested remember we said when they're ingested into the bloodstream faster than you can burn it and then all this insulin shoves them out into the cell but less than an hour has passed and in that hour you've only burned about a hundred calories so the excess has to be converted to fat so even though you've converted all these calories to fat you're still having cravings because the reverse process is too slow and your body needs, your brain needs this fuel fast. So it's going to tell you, give me some more sugar, give me some more blood sugar. Okay? 
So this is the devastating roller coaster that's the foundation of developing diabetes and virtually half of all the diseases known to mankind. Who has heard of insulin resistance? Insulin resistance is also known as prediabetes. And we'll cover some numbers here in a minute. But here's basically how it works. You have a little diagram, but I'll try to draw it as we go. Um, I'll just draw the one. So here is, here is a cell. And the cell has a membrane. And out around here are sugar molecules. And we'll just draw them round for simplicity. So we have some sugar molecules out here, and the cell needs the sugar inside because nothing happens in the body until the energy is inside the cell. So now we need something called an insulin receptor. And here is the insulin receptor, and it looks like that, let's say. And then comes around, and I'll keep drawing colors here. Uh, then we have insulin, and we'll just draw that as a triangle. And insulin floats around, and then insulin makes its way and attaches to the receptor, and it causes a conformation change. So now, this, this channel is available to process and, and transport glucose. So here comes the glucose molecule. Before it was just floating around, but now because of the insulin, it can get inside the cell. So inside the cell, we need to maintain a certain amount of glucose to create energy for the metabolic processes and the life of the cell. But we only need so much at a time, so that's why the fuel supply needs to be gradual. And that's why, again, the sugar is so devastating because it's not gradual, it just, it's an avalanche. Uh, so we have, let me draw a few more of these. So there's a receptor, there's a receptor, there's a receptor, and there's a receptor. So in order to process and get a gradual supply of sugar, we need a certain amount of receptors, and we need a certain amount of insulin. So, hypothetically speaking, for, for illustration purposes, this amount of receptors and this amount of insulin will provide that much sugar for the cell. And that will maintain the processes. Now, we have a bunch of Coca-Cola and donuts and junk food and syrup. And all of a sudden, we have five times as much sugar in the bloodstream. Here's all that sugar. And it's just banging on the door to, to get into the cell. And there's some insulin receptors that are attaching and they're allowing the sugar to get into the cell. But with this much sugar around, pretty soon the cell is going to be saturated. And it's going to say, well, you know, hold off, guys. I don't need that much. So what's the cell going to do? We know the principle of use it or lose it, that the body will always only replenish the resources that it needs. And if there's this much sugar, the cell doesn't need this many receptors. So there's two steps. It's going to turn down its sensitivity. It's going to turn down its allowance. So it's going to say for every insulin molecule, I'm only going to let in half as many sugar molecules. That's the first step of insulin resistance. The second step is that it's going to say, you know, with this much sugar, I don't need all these receptors. I can get, with this much sugar, I can get all the sugar I want inside the cell with half as many receptors. 
because when it rains, it pours. So imagine that you had a cabin and you were living off the land and the only water that you had was rainwater. And so every time it rained, you had a hundred buckets and you would go put the buckets out and collect the rainwater and you get that much water in each bucket and then you collected all the buckets and you put them in and, and you got four buckets worth of water and you were good for a week. And then hopefully it rained again within the next week. What would happen if it was always raining? It was always pouring down. Would you still put out a hundred buckets? Or would you just sit on the porch and stick a bucket out when you needed some? That's what the cell is doing. When it's raining too, when it's too much, when it's a, a, an abundant availability, it's not going to make as many receptors. That's called down regulation of receptors. And it's one of the most crucial principles in physiology. That your body will adapt to your environment. So diabetes is not a disease, it's an adaptation and nothing more. It's a physiological adaptation. And also what happens now, we still have all this sugar in the bloodstream. What did we say about too much blood sugar in the, sugar in the bloodstream? We said it's an emergency. The brain will go into a coma. So now, we have a, a challenging situation because the brain needs to get the sugar out of the bloodstream but the cells don't want it. So now the brain says to the pancreas we need to get this out of here make more insulin make a whole bunch of insulin and if you make enough you can cram all that into the cell and you can turn it all into fat but in the long run you're pushing the system so hard it's going to break. Because if the pancreas is always being made to produce more and more and more insulin, and the cell is becoming more and more insulin resistant, then you're pushing the system from two directions, and it, the, the system doesn't want to play like that. So eventually what happens is the pancreas burns out. And you have so much insulin resistance in the cells that the pancreas can't keep up making enough insulin. And that's, that's the end stage of insulin resistance and prediabetes. And if you push this just a little bit further, now the pancreas breaks down and stops making insulin altogether. And you have just developed type 2 diabetes, insulin dependent. Now your body can't make insulin at all or very very limited amounts and certainly not enough for insulin resistant cells so now all this insulin is gone all the blood sugar is still there and now the cell isn't getting any sugar now the sugar is saying hey where did my sugar go and now it starts making new receptors, it starts to upregulate the receptors, but it's too late because there is no insulin to transport it across. And this is why diabetes is called starvation in the midst of plenty because now you have all this food in the bloodstream, but none of it's getting into the cell. So the initial stage of diabetes, people will lose weight before they have figured out that they can't make insulin. All right? So the important thing to realize about this is that your body is magnificent. It's a healing machine. It's amazing. If it down-regulates something, it can up-regulate it again. So what has to happen to this picture? As long as you have some pancreas function left, you can salvage it, but you have to get rid of the insulin resistance. So what do you have to do? You have to balance your blood sugar. You have to get back to your hunter-gatherer diet and make sure that the insulin gets 
into the, the, the sugar gets into the bloodstream very, very gradually. And the second thing you have to do is exercise. You have to move. And why is that? Because during exercise, something magical happens and these cells can start taking in glucose without insulin or with extremely small amounts. Okay. So, I'll take questions afterwards if there's any part of this that's, that's unclear. But re remember, it's all about use it or lose it. And that holds true for cells and receptors also. And upregulation and downregulation is a crucial mechanism of all cells in the body. So, one favorite cartoon again, Glass Bergen. This lady is talking to the doctor and says, I think diabetes is affecting my eyesight. I have trouble seeing the consequences of poor food choices. <laughs> I love it. So, how does, the, how does this problem occur in the first place? And there's a lot of talk about something called glycemic index. And we'll talk very, very quickly about what that is. Um, it basically measures how soon after you eat something has that been converted into sugar and entered the blood. So if something's converted very slowly and absorbed very slowly, it's said to have a low glycemic index. So low glycemic index are things like fat, protein, whole foods, vegetables, meat, fish, and nuts. In other words, most of the things that, that nature produces in their whole form. Uh, something that is processed, something that will, doesn't need much digestion, that is almost sugar as you eat it, will get into the bloodstream almost instantly, and that's called a high glycemic index. So when you want to start controlling this, you need to look at glycemic indexes, and you want to keep them, as if you want to correct a situation that's already out of hand, you need to keep very, very, very low glycemic indexes. You basically cannot have any sugar or starch or anything like that. And don't be fooled when they say whole wheat or complex carbohydrates because it is still a high glycemic index food. It will still get out very, very quickly. And in between, there's some medium uh, glycemic index. Those would basically be beans and whole fruit. And let me make a note there that while a whole fruit has a medium glycemic index, if you juice it, it becomes a high glycemic index because you break up the cell walls and you take away all the fiber and all the sugar becomes available instantly. So a juice is not the same thing as a fruit. And when they say made from, that means it's not what it used to be. <laughs> Simple as that. And another note on, uh, I just used milk as an example, that because fat takes longer to process, and milk has both fat and uh, lactose in it, which is a sugar, then if you drink whole milk, preferably raw whole milk, then the fat will balance out the sugar so it becomes a medium glycemic index. Whereas if you drink a skim milk, You've taken all the fat away, so there's nothing to buffer the sugar, and that becomes a high glycemic index. Okay? So, understand the, the principles, and then you can figure things out for yourself. So now is the time to shake you up and scare you a little bit. And the people in this room, you already know a lot about this, I can tell. But think about people you know, and, and take this to heart and realize that a lot of what we're talking about in all these sessions, it kind of applies across the board, even though we're just talking about diabetes today. Side effects and complications. Diabetes is the primary or contributing cause of death in 231,000 cases in 2007. That's a lot of people. The primary or contributing cause of death. Estimated costs $174 billion. And that's medical costs, work loss, and disability. So it's not just the expense, 
but at some point people are unable to maintain their work and they, they're disabled, which means they can't really enjoy life at all. Nervous system damage occurs in 60 to 70 percent of diabetes. That means that the sugar is the sugar in the bloodstream uh, is so much above where it's supposed to be that it starts penetrating the tissues around it and it causes when and sugar in the tissues attracts water and causes swelling. So that's why you have uh, vascular problems and neurological problems because the vascularity, the, the, the blood is around the nerves as well so it's going to choke off, close off blood vessels and nerves and that is why diabetes is also the leading cause of blindness because the blood vessels in the retina are so fine and so sensitive. The diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness. There's 4.2 million people with diabetic retinopathy. Uh, leading cause of kidney failure. There's 202,000 people in chronic dialysis. They have to have, they don't have any kidney function. They have to have them filtered because of diabetes. And it's again the, the vascular problem, blood vessel swelling. It's the leading cause of amputation. 65,700 cases of a complete leg amputation. And there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of cases where they start taking off one toe at a time because they lose uh, their control, they lose the vascularity. So whenever they, they hit something and break something or break the skin, it doesn't heal again. Okay, the brain is shut off from the body part, means it can't do its business anymore. Um, and also increases risk of heart disease, stroke, dental disease, coma, pneumonia, influenza, and depression. Do you need any more reasons? Okay. This, this is what quality of life is about. And we're talking about something that affects a huge, huge portion of the population. So, do you know anyone with insulin resistance? Someone who is pre-diabetic? Uh, go ahead and just write down five people that you care about who could benefit from what you just learned. Just go down and, and, and scribble down some names real quick. So, <clears throat> consider letting these people know what we talked about and consider bringing them next time that we talk about this or related topic because it could save their life. Okay, this is serious business. Uh, let's look at the prevalence, because if you don't think that you know anybody or that you're in good shape, then this is the prevalence in 2010, and this is from the National Institute of Health.gov website, the National Diabetes Information Clearinghouse. Uh, diabetes affects 8.3% of the population. That's 25,800,000 people right now that have to take insulin. Then, when we get uh, to ages above 65 years old, it affects 26.9% of the population that are diabetic. That's 10,900,000 people. That's, that's a huge number. It's almost becoming the norm for people above a certain age to get these conditions. And we've seen that it's about upregulation, downregulation. It's a physiological adaptation to chronic stupidity. That's all it is. And it's, it's a stupidity that is recommended by the American Diabetes Association and the American Heart Association and the four food groups and so on. Pre-diabetes, these are people who are insulin resistant with a greater risk. It's basically a matter of time before they develop this. And keep in mind, when we talk about these numbers, that we are the first generation to be exposed at this level. That the pre-diabetic people, a lot of them will become diabetic because this is the first time we've, we've eaten like this. 35% uh, of adults 20 years or older are pre-diabetic. That's 79 million people in this country alone. Are pre-diabetic. Those are some scary numbers 
And when you get to the elderly, 65 or older, it's 50%, one in two. And we've just talked about the side effects and complications. So these people are, are heading for trouble. And it is completely reversible. I'm not going to tell you that 100% of diabetes can be reversed. Type 1, we don't really know if anyone can be helped, but I would venture to say that 98% or more of type 2 diabetes is completely reversible. If you have any insulin production at all left, then it's just a matter of lifestyle. What factors affect insulin resistance? Well, we talked about food. Anything with a high glycemic index is going to make the sugar rush into the bloodstream and stress the system and cause a physiological adaptation. So that's the number one. But we also need to understand that stress raises cortisol. Whenever you're stressed, your body believes that it has to perform extra work that there's an emergency it has to defend itself against and it's going to need energy to expend during this emergency so it will tell all your tissues to raise the blood sugar it will start breaking down protein to convert some of that into blood sugar and it will give you cravings so that you can raise your blood sugar even more that's why people who are stressed have cravings it's because of cortisol uh, there are drugs, there are some specifically called Tequin and Seroquel that have been linked to developing diabetes. But anything with cortisone, corticosteroid, the medical form of cortisone is the, the version of human cortisol. So anytime that you take those drugs which are supposed to be anti-inflammatory, you also raise your blood sugar and you're setting yourself up for insulin resistance. Now let's look at the good side. How do we help it? Exercise, exercise, exercise. Okay, first of all, you're burning off sugar, but secondly, you're reducing insulin resistance because your cells become more sensitive to insulin when you're exercising. You need none or very little insulin to absorb the sugar. So most, most type 2 diabetes, you can pretty much get off insulin instantly if you just start exercising enough and keeping your blood sugar, the, the foods level. Good heart rate variability. This, the things we're talking about in this office, breathing and heart rate variability, it is linked to all of these mechanisms. So when you increase your heart rate variability, you reduce your stress, you reduce your cortisol, and it has been inversely linked to developing of, of diabetes. Chiropractic reduces stress for many reasons, and we'll talk about that separately, because uh, there's a lot of neurological mechanisms. Uh, but it's known that chiropractic reduces stress. People feel better. Uh, we'll talk about the details. And breathing exercises, like I said, heart rate variability. Breathing exercises, feeling good, feeling relaxed, practicing relaxation, visualizations, they all reduce stress. And all of that will help with reducing insulin resistance. So now, I think I've got you sort of paying attention and thinking that, you know, this is more than, than just a, a, a curiosity. So being a chiropractor and talking about this, this, this is my passion, this is what it's all about. It's the big picture. Uh, back pain, schmack pain. It's like, who cares? That's, back pain just indicates that there's something in the body that isn't working. That's the tip of the iceberg. The diabetes and the heart disease and the strokes and all of that stuff, that's the bigger picture. That's what we're really working for. And as you well know, chiropractic affects the brain, it reduces stress, and it helps with all of these things. Okay? So, in chiropractic, the stage one, that's just initial crisis care. That's just reversing the pain, breaking the patterns, and getting people feeling better. Unfortunately, most people think it's just about pain, so as soon as they feel better, they think they're all better and then they go get diabetes or heart disease or something else 
uh, a few years later. But what we're talking about is to continue this until everything in the body that's supposed to work is working. So stage two is stabilization care. That means that we keep going past the pain. We work on the nervous system. We work on exercising and doing specific things to balance out the nervous system to become more stable. A more stable nervous system and brain can handle stress and it can turn off and balance sympathetics, parasympathetics better. It's all nervous system. And then stage three, once we get up to a good level, now we need to maintain that lifestyle. We get maintenance chiropractic for peak performance and we keep doing all the right things to maintain top function. Uh, check out the previous uh, talk we did on heart rate variability and you can see how it affects immune system, immunoglobulins, how it affects cortisol, DHEA, how it affects cognitive performance and reaction time. We're truly talking peak performance. So it's, it's not about pain. That's just the tiny little thing we, we get started with. It's about quality of life at any age. So the people who are still young and don't have many symptoms, that's the time to start taking care of things. By the time you're 65 and you're 40 years into a disease process, you already have so much degeneration that it's much, much, much harder to turn it around to get a quality life again. So if there are any questions, we'll take those now. And other than that, I would like to thank you very much for coming.